dear Sultan, it's uh, always a joy to see you. And I have to say, uh, ever since our school days, I always left our conversations uh, feeling more inspired and wiser than we began them. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, today will be um, another one of those uh, experiences. Uh, but no, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bader. It's a pleasure to, uh, to, re to reconnect with you after all these months. It's been almost two years since we met uh, in person. And... Uh, I look forward to this conversation. So do I. For those of you who may not know, in which case, shame on you, but uh, Sultan Saud Al Qasimi is a globally recognized voice uh, from what is also my beloved home city, uh, Sharjah, in the United Arab Emirates. He's a social entrepreneur, researcher, a lecturer, a columnist, uh, and a scholar in his own right who's been contributing to the work of top academic centers of excellence around the world, including the likes of NYU. Yale, Georgetown, uh, Boston College, uh, Harvard Kennedy School, and uh, the University, American University of Paris. Sultan continues to be very creative in the classroom, teaching courses like New Arab Hip Hop, French uh, Policy in the Arab World, uh, and the Politics of Modern Middle Eastern uh, Art, which he's currently teaching at Brandeis uh, University. Sultan's insights have been featured by publishing houses that influence uh, socioeconomic and public policy making, including uh, the Financial Times, Foreign Policy, The Independent, HuffPost, The New York Times, uh, and The Guardian, uh, to name a few. Uh, Sultan is the founder of the Bergil Art Foundation, a pan-Arab project uh, that I greatly admire for its contribution to the uh, intellectual development of modern and contemporary Arab uh, art with with more than 1,100 pieces uh, in its uh, collection. Since 2013, the foundation has mounted over 25 exhibitions across the world, uh, including in Egypt, the UK, Jordan, the US, uh, Kuwait, Singapore, uh, and Iran. Dear Sultan, uh, you established uh, Berjil Foundation, uh, I believe, 11 years ago. Could you explain how it goes about fulfilling its mission and how you uh, track its overall impact? And, and do you also uh, believe that the foundation is on the track that you envisaged for it back in 2010? Thank you so much, Bader, for that uh, very kind introduction. And it's on point and it's correct. And it's very rare that someone gets everything right, that like you did that already. So uh, yes, so Barjil was uh, founded in, uh, about 11 years ago or so with the uh, idea of promoting art from what is known as the Arab world. Uh, the Arab world is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, region of uh, our planet. It involves, it includes 22 countries, but it includes dozens of nations. And there are many uh, ethnic groups there that are represented uh, in the Arab world um, culturally, but never represented politically. And of course, this reminded me of a time in which there was a pan-Arab project to bring the region together, but the, the pan-Arab project of the 50s and 60s neglected our minorities, neglected the diversity within the region, which is something I try to uh, make sure that we don't repeat in, a ter in terms of a cultural project. And so the foundation's ethos, the foundation's drive is to promote art from these uh, 22 Arab states uh, but including all the different minorities in this organization. We try to show artists who are, of course, uh, ethnically Arab uh, and, uh, and, and, and Muslim, but that is just because that is the majority of the region doesn't mean that this is the sole representation of the region. So we have a huge, uh, within, within Islam, we have a diverse uh, re religious uh, uh, communities within Islam. Then we have a, a sizable Christian minority. We have still Jewish minorities. We have ethnic groups like Turkmen and the Farsi, Persians, and um, uh, Amazigh, and so many other uh, groups. And so we make sure that these groups are uh, represented in all our exhibitions. Um, so it is, uh, hopefully it has succeeded in this two or three dozen exhibitions that we put around the world to promote art from our part of the world. It's a small organization. We're only a team of five or six, but we've mounted exhibitions, as you said, in about 15 countries around the world. Uh, and I think I am proud of where we are. I wish, of course, people always have larger ambitions. And I think it's important to also um, uh, sort of stop and check and always try to uh, 
comprehend the, the changing dynamics and the, 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 the many variables that we have to contend with. But I am very happy. Uh, and to answer the second part of your question, uh, has, it, uh, has it fulfilled the original uh, mission and is it where I want it to be? Uh, yes, very much so. We have a touring exhibition now taking place in the US. We are in negotiations with one or two museums around the world. And importantly for me, uh, Bedr, is that initially I had thought that I want to promote Arab art internationally, but it turns out that what we need to do is promote Arab art locally and regionally, because this is where the understanding needs to emanate from. If we want young people from the Arab world to, uh, to be proud of uh, the, the art and culture, they need to see it. So it's great to show it in Singapore and great to show it in the US, but we also must think about showing it regionally and locally, which is where I think we've slightly adjusted the mission of the foundation. I think that's very profound. And as you say, um, makes total sense uh, that one needs to first understand oneself before they can uh, properly uh, showcase uh, what they represent to others. Uh, so uh, that's, that's fantastic. Looking back uh, to the so-called Islamic Golden Age during uh, the 8th uh, and 9th centuries, innovation happened really at the intersection between the humanities and sciences. Today, though, it, it, it often feels like uh, the arts is considered to be more ornamental rather than fundamental. Uh, do you see a correlation uh, between socio-economic development and the arts? Uh, and if so, how does one work on making that correlation better appreciated in mainstream policymaking and also business decisions? Oh, uh, there's, of course, there's certainly a very strong correlation. First of all, the, we need to emphasize that at the height of the Islamic uh, Renaissance era uh, was a key theme of diversity and inclusion. So a lot of the scientists were Jewish, for example, but they felt part and parcel of society. They were uh, promoted equally as much as the Christian and the Muslims and everybody else. So it's important, the idea of diversity and inclusion and respect of, uh, for the other is, is integral to the success of any society. And the other thing is that art plays an important role because art gives people a sense of ownership to society. Now, uh, when you think of countries as diverse as uh, Iraq, Iran, Egypt and Morocco, you will notice that at the, again, at the peak of their scientific uh, innovation uh, was a unifying cultural and socio-political identity. And the way that this was uh, achieved was to go back in time into, um, into, uh, into uh, uh, reaching uh, for heritage that brought everyone together. And so the, 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 way I, the way that you saw it manifest itself in Egypt, for example, is that th there, was a, uh, there was a theme of neo-pharaohism, neo-pharaonism as they call it sometimes. So in the 1920s, uh, the Egyptian artists and sculptors who, sculptors who were either uh, Jewish or Muslim or Christian or any other uh, Baha'i or any other religion, they looked towards Egyptian heritage uh, because that was a way of unifying everybody rather than uh, emphasize on contemporary politics and, and modern politics, they look at heritage. The Iraqis did the same with Sumerian and Babylonian history. The Moroccans did the same and the Algerians did the same with their Amazigh history. And the same thing also applied to, uh, to Iranian, uh, Assyrian and, and other uh, cultures of uh, Persia. And so, uh, so it's important to find a unified sense of identity that everybody could belong to and aspire to. And of course, if you want people to innovate, you need to give them a sense of belonging. And this is something that I think that, that, that we lack uh, in uh, many parts of the Arab world. And I feel that the UAE is trying to start, is trying to give uh, this sense of belonging, or at least a sense of semi-permanence, if not of uh, ultimate permanence to a lot of people from the region. So this could be an interesting model to look at. And I wonder if any other countries are doing the same. So much of what you say um, from a historical context and perspective is so relevant, if not even more today. And that, as you say, um, striking that balance between, I guess, creating that unified identity, but at the same time, respecting everybody's diversity. And the fact that through diversity, we are stronger. Uh, and through our differences, we can be stronger. And, and I. 
I, as a, a proud Emirati also and resident of the UAE, can also um, uh, really acknowledge the incredible efforts being done to try and strike that balance. It's not easy. Uh, and it's something that the Arab world has been lacking for, for many years, as you say. But going, I guess, from the 8th, 9th century to uh, today, um, uh, if you were, uh, you know, how would you describe uh, the, the current state of the nonprofit uh, landscape uh, in the Arab region? Uh, and as we begin to come out of the depths of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we pray, what issues do you think uh, strategic philanthropists in the Arab region uh, and around the world should be turning their attention to and, and why? So I think that the state of uh, philanthropy in the region is quite complex because people are very generous. People are willing to give, but they're willing to give to specific causes. They're willing to give for religious causes, for example. They want to give to build a mosque. They want to give to build, um, a, you know, uh, maybe uh, a, a sort of a, a institution that is affiliated to a, a religious cause. And so this is something that is important because it's, again, it's integral to the identity of many people in the region. But this is not the only thing that we are in need of. Yes, we are in need of giving to religious institutions, for example. But maybe rather than build a new mosque, maybe we need to renovate uh, an existing mosque. So the, the idea needs to be adjusted. So we need to preserve uh, our historical mosques. And that is where there is a lack of giving, for example. Another avenue where there is lack of giving is the education sector. So people think that there is more, uh, that, that there's more reward from, from the, the hereafter and from, from God when, when you build again a religious uh, uh, institute or, or a mosque, rather than to build a hospital, rather than to build a, um, an education institute rather than building an orphanage, rather than building a, uh, a, a technology hub, uh, you know, or infrastructure, because is there, is there a reward? So we, is there a reward if you build infrastructure? But the reality is, yes, there is a reward. There is a reward because people can get to work, they can earn money. If you create jobs, that is also some kind of, there, there is a religious connotation. There is a religious reward if you give people the avenues to earn money. And so this is something that we need to capitalize on People are uh, very generous, and as you see, whenever there's a drive uh, to 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 uh, to uh, raise money for, uh, for example, an earthquake that took place somewhere in the world, you will see that there's a lot of people who are willing to give and help. So our societies in the Arab world, uh, in the Muslim world, are very generous, but sometimes they're generous, they're overly generous to a certain cause and less generous to uh, other causes. Um, we also don't have the idea of. Um, philanthropy as the West understands it. A lot of people in the Arab world are too shy to, to say that they have given to an organization or an institution. But this is new. It's a new phenomenon that some people are willing to say, although I feel like it's still frowned upon, that people say, why is this family putting their name towards this organization or this building or this chair or this institute? Uh, so this is an issue that we need to tell people this is to encourage others. It's not to, it's not only because this family wants the credit and what, what's wrong with having credit, but it's also because you're encouraging others to do this. So this is another issue that we have. Um, and again, our tax uh, system needs to be uh, modified and rectified uh, to, to give people tax breaks. So if you think, for instance, of, uh, of a lot of the uh, charitable donations here in the US, why is the US uh, overtaking Europe when it comes to uh, institutions and organizations that have endowments. Why does Yale have a, a $30 billion endowment, whereas a typical university in the UK has a few hundred million? It's because that th these, these institutions are able to uh, take advantage of the, the tax system in the US. So this is something that now that we have a VAT tax in the UAE and other forms of tax in the UAE with, with Oman, I think Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and other countries introducing tax, we need to, 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 to introduce this idea of tax breaks if you give to the correct, um, uh, the, you know, if you give to certain, um, a, uh, a certain uh, institutes or industries. And the, the, the final thing uh, I will add about uh, philanthropy is that it is not structured properly. You don't know how to get a license. You don't know from where to get registered. Uh, many, many nonprofits don't have a board of advisors. Many nonprofits don't have a board of directors. 
many uh, many nonprofits don't find themselves uh, um, don't allow themselves to be held accountable to the outside world, which is important because this is a for public good, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, organization. So there needs to be accountability, but there needs to be structure. Uh, I know that in the UAE there are nine ways of getting a nonprofit license, and each one of them is very complicated. It could be an emiri decree, it could be through the Chamber of Commerce, but it could also be through a foreign embassy, which is how a number of schools are registered in the UAE, like the British schools and the American schools and the French schools and the German schools. These are all registered through embassies, and so that that is interesting. But you need to have a workable, structured. Policy when it comes to nonprofits, because you need to encourage nonprofits. The government cannot be subsidizing and building everything. Philanthropists, merchants, businessmen, corporations want to do this, but it needs to be very uh, straightforward. I mean, so much of what you said is uh, precisely why the Center for Strategic Philanthropy was established at uh, the University of Cambridge, with a focus on, of course, the emerging markets uh, or the global growth markets, including, of course. Uh, the countries in the Middle East and North Africa. I just want to touch on the cultural uh, dynamic that you referred to um, in terms of how different regions and different cultures relate to philanthropy. Uh, would you say that there is a cultural shift which is really linked to the generational shift uh, in the Middle East and North Africa in terms of how they relate to philanthropy, but I guess more broadly also social impact? and you yourself come from a prominent uh, multi-generational family business. Is this some, is, are these the sort of discussions you have in your own family uh, about how to engage in philanthropy and perhaps change habits related to giving? This is such an interesting point because first of all, I, I, I actually believe that the, the, the previous generation was very, very uh, generous. So the, the, the founding generation of the modern businesses in the, in the Middle East and North Africa in the mid 20th century were very generous uh, families. And this are, these are huge merchant families across the, the Gulf, the Middle East, North Africa. So this is something that we have to appreciate, uh, but there was no structure. Uh, and I, the, the biggest example <coughs> I can think of, first of all, there are all these, um, uh, all these uh, giant, um, sovereign wealth funds uh, and, 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 and whatnot and, and other uh, funds that were established like Kuwait. Kuwait established a fund in the 1960s or 70s and they have been so generous with the rest of the world and helping uh, you know, dig wells in Africa and build dams and, and offer people opportunities. So Kuwait is one of the most generous. Another very generous country was the UAE. And I think this is the example I wanna emphasize on. And the UAE had never in its almost 50 years history, had never tallied how much foreign aid it gave since its founding in 1971. And only recently, it, it found out that it had given several ten, tens of billions of dollars. I think it was 200 billion dirhams, which is about $45 billion that the UAE has given as foreign aid. And better, I had spoken to somebody in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the UAE and said, we will never know the true amount of foreign aid that was given because the founding father of the UAE was giving people, well, I don't know if you call it checkbook diplomacy or they were ordering individuals. In many cases, it, uh, people were too, um, it was seen as, uh, uh, um, uh, as a faux pas. I don't know how to say it, but you don't say that you've given somebody. So you, you almost are shy to tell people that I've helped somebody. Uh, and so you can never tally this number. But it's important to tally this number. It's important to know because uh, better we realized in the Gulf states, in the region, that foreign aid and philanthropy can be a tool of soft power. When Qatar was trying to win the, uh, the World Cup, it went and it used its tool of soft power and the cultural diplomacy and soft, uh, you know, and investments. The UAE, similarly, when the UAE uh, was lobbying to host IRENA in Abu Dhabi, and to host Expo in Dubai, uh, a lot of it was to do with foreign aid that we have given your, that the UAE's lobbyists would go meet with these representatives of these nations and say, but we have built a dam and we have supported you and we have offered education opportunities. We'd like you to vote for us to host this organization. And so it's, it's not a quid pro quo 
but it is, it, it, I think it's a way of understanding international relations that, that we all depend on each other, that even the smallest countries, uh, Micronesia has a vote at the UN, equal to that of uh, Russia. So you could imagine that, um, that every country, have, no matter how big or how small, can be an important uh, uh, way or avenue for you to reach your goal as if the UAE is in question here as a medium-sized power, as they say, uh, you need every single uh, member of the international community. And you know, this opportunity to really understand this soft power that you talk about is one that hasn't yet been captured, not just in our region, but globally, uh, I mean, uh, and you know, whereas there are many think tanks and institutions focusing on uh, geopolitics and also geoeconomics, uh, I'm quite interested in a, in a term which I've co coined called geophilanthropy, really understanding the impact of philanthropic capital uh, around the world, which is effectively that soft power that you mentioned. In some cases, it's, it's as simple as just measuring it. I mean, just taking the Islamic uh, alms giving as a as an as an example uh you know the islamic community is a very generous community and that it donates between zakat which as you know is uh, compulsory alms giving and sadaqah which is discretionary alms giving anywhere between 400 billion to a trillion dollars a year all right and this is you know from the two billion or so muslim community out there but the question is where is that money going what impact is it generating and the simple fact that you have uh, really one in, in three uh, Muslims potentially living below the poverty line is an indication that perhaps we don't quite know. Uh, uh, we haven't certainly maximized the impact of that giving. So this, is, this, this general space is huge opportunity. Zooming into uh, uh, an aspect of philanthropy that I know you're very passionate about. Uh, as a committed advocate uh, of cultural diplomacy, who is in many ways uh, utilizing art as an extension of social commentary on the Middle East's developments. Do you believe that philanthropy can play and perhaps should play a role in advancing cultural diplomacy? Certainly, uh, Badr. I can, I can tell you of a, a, a true life example of a museum in the Middle East with one of the largest collections of modern art. Uh, this is this is a active example that just took place a few months ago. This museum was suffering, uh, uh, you know, financial shortages because they were unable to pay for their staff. They were at the, on the brink of shutting down. It's one of my favorite museums. It's playing an important role in educating its members of society. They have a lot of workshops for children. They have workshops for adults. They do. They go beyond, uh, you know, painting and, and art, and they go into. Uh, uh, they go into education, educating the public, educating adults. And so uh, this museum, the staff reached out to me and said, we have not been paid in months. And there's talk about them shutting us down. And I, uh, I contributed a small amount of money just to keep them going for a short while. But then I reached out to the UAE uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the UAE Cultural Ministry. And they, paid, they, they offered them a, a, quite a, a sizable donation and that is keeping the museum going at least for the next year or so, while the museum is able to find its bearings. And so this is a very important role. And this is a country that is an, uh, an allied country to us in the region, but even if it wasn't allied to us, the impact that that has uh, on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the museum and the, the wider society, I think goes beyond the immediate political uh, advantages and benefits that we might get. This is a medium to a long-term play that we are trying to keep your cultural uh, organizations afloat. And so, uh, yes, uh, and by the way, this is discreet to the point that I can't even mention which country, which museum this is in. So the UAE has been doing so much good. And this is an example of where, uh, you know, where we cannot really ultimately tally the amount of, uh, of, of help that we are giving each other. And by the way, I am sure, and I, I, I only use the examples of the UAE because I'm familiar with them, but I am sure that there are many other people around the region also, and many other governments, or at least some governments, are also trying to, to offer help and, and, uh, and assistance to others in need. But not all of it is tallied. And as an extension, I guess, to the previous question, is there an ideal or optimal role for private philanthropy in the field of art? And for the uh, young philanthropists watching this who are interested 
in focusing their efforts uh, in this field. What advice would you give them? Uh, uh, maybe from the previous example I mentioned is I was able to donate a small amount of money because that's what I could afford or relatively small. But then maybe my role is to find for them sources because I am in touch with merchants or with, with corporations and businessmen and government. So I was maybe able to channel in some more money to this organization. I think young philanthropists should not underestimate the, the, the reach that they have, at least through their network. Uh, maybe they can uh, help these uh, institutions restructure through advice and telling them, listen, you need to cut down costs here. You really don't need to do this because it just costs so much money. Perhaps you can cut down a small number of staff in order to keep the rest of the organization going. So it's not always financial, but you can also, as a young philanthropist, maybe spend time because your time is also worth money, but you can spend time with these uh, cultural institutions and advise them. Uh, in many cases, uh, better uh, just uh, just advising these institutions can help them uh, progress and can help them diversify, can help them apply for international funding if they just restructure themselves, for example, if they, uh, if they apply for registration somewhere uh, globally. So there are many things that, that young philanthropists can do that is beyond just financial uh, assistance, which is also important. Indeed. Always an honor, Azizi, and on behalf of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy at the University of Cambridge, uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your always excellent and authentic uh, insights uh, and advice uh, with us. Uh, and now that I have your attention, I'm going to pin you down to committing to that long overdue catch-up coffee, uh, inshallah, soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.